Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our online session, our online service over Zoom this morning at Queensbury uh, Baptist Church in Nottingham. Um, maybe you're joining us online after the service, and uh, if that's the case, uh, a very warm welcome to you. Um, you can find out more about us at uh, qbc.org.uk, and please do drop us a line and let us know you're watching. So before we start this morning's service that's uh, going to be led by myself, Chris, uh, we're going to be joined by Mel, who's going to bring our all-age talk, and Jacqueline, who's going to continue our series in Colossians. Um, and this morning, she's going to be reading from Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. So before we do that, let's just take a moment to come before the Lord. Lord, we give thanks that as we gather together this morning, uh, that we read in your word, and you say that for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. And so, Lord, we just give thanks this morning that as we gather, we have the confidence and the faith that you are here with us. And so, Lord, as we celebrate your name, as we celebrate Jesus Christ, we just do so wanting to glorify you. And we just pray that you would bless our time together this morning. And Lord, just lead us all in prayer and worship as we worship your name. And before we go into uh, this morning's first worship song, uh, I'm just going to share with you some uh, notices uh, for the life of Queensbury uh, Baptist Church. Um, so for those of our congregation that are involved in uh, any kind of youth or children ministry or working with uh, adults that, that may be vulnerable. Um, we have our second training session, our second safeguarding training session this coming Tuesday. Um, so if you weren't able to join us on Saturday just gone, um, then please do make that Tuesday session. Uh, and Sally has been in contact with you. Um, if you're not able to make it, then please let us know and we will sort um, another time when we can complete that training. But it is important that everybody that's involved in those sessions uh, receives this training. Also a reminder that um, we are working towards reopening church on Sunday the 11th of October. Um, and we're looking at uh, a booking system uh, to facilitate that. Um, so watch out because there will be more news on how that's going to work in, in the coming week. Um, so keep an eye out for the information uh, that'll be coming your way. Uh, and just pray um, as we work towards that date that um, nothing will come in the way of that and that we can gather together um, in our church building and celebrate as we once did. And then finally, a message for our members. Um, we had our first uh, members meeting in a long time last week. And we are now working towards our AGM, which will be on the 2nd of November. Um, so just please pray for the leaders as they meet in the coming week to uh, work and plan uh, towards that AGM that will hopefully take place in November. So we're here to praise and worship our Lord and Saviour this morning. And we're going to start this morning's worship with that song, Here I Am to Worship.
story about Jesus from Luke chapter 19. And this is Jesus. Now, Jesus was going through the town of Jericho one day. But in that town, there was a very rich man, and he was a tax collector. And nobody liked him because they were convinced that he got rich by cheating people out of their money. And this man was called Zacchaeus. And this is Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus really wanted to see Jesus. However, he wasn't a very tall man. So all those crowds that were surrounding Jesus, well, he couldn't see Jesus. And no matter how hard he tried, as Jesus was going along, he was trying to get through and he, he just couldn't see. I thought, how am I going to see Jesus? Until he saw down the road, there was, there was a big tree. And he thought, aha, that's the thing to do. I know, I'll run down the road and I'll climb that big tree. So off he goes, runs down the road and up the tree, climbs up the tree, not very dignified, was it? Up the tree he goes and then Jesus comes along. Well, he thinks, well, he's got bird's eye view now. And he sees Jesus coming along. And Jesus gets underneath the tree and stops and suddenly looks up and says, Zacchaeus, what are you doing up that tree? Come down. I want to come and stay at your house. Zacchaeus, oh my goodness. So he comes down the tree. Yes, Lord, that would be fantastic. You'll be very welcome at my house today. But all the people start chuntering and saying, whoa, what's Jesus want to stay at his house for? He's a really bad man. He's a cheat. And, whoa, you know, he bezels people out of their money and he's not a very nice man. What's Jesus want to go to his house for? But Zacchaeus, his heart had been changed by meeting Jesus. And he said to Jesus, I'm very rich and I want to give half of all my money to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of any money at all, I will give them back four times what I took. And Jesus said, wow, today, Zacchaeus, you've been saved and God loves you. Let's pray. Praying from John three sixteen. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege that we can come before you and pray for everything. Lord, your word says, Though God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that you have drawn us to yourself. And today we stand in the gap as your word says, Lord, and pray for the world, the affected places and the places where the virus is affecting people. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will pour your mercy and release your healing upon people who have been traumatized, people who have been affected by the fear of the virus in the name of Jesus. We lift up authorities before you. We pray that you will give them divine wisdom and knowledge of the way they should handle and deal with the viruses and its spreading. Lord, continue to shine your light upon your people. This morning, we bring our heart together before you. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will continue to feed us with your word. For your word says, O oh Lord, grace and mercy increases when we have knowledge of you. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that as we sit before you and learn from you, today let your word have impact upon us that we will go out here, Lord, and be nourished, satisfied with the word that holds us and leads us to eternal life. Glorify yourself this morning, O Lord. Let your word set captives free. Let your word bring healing. Let your word bring life. Let it bring hope, Lord. Let it energize us, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. We pray for Jacqueline now, Lord, that you will pour your divine grace upon her, that the well, your words that will come out of her mouth will have the power to heal, to set free, to restore, 
to open our eyes, Lord, open our understanding, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We bless you for such a wonderful moment together. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Good morning to you all. Over the last few Sundays, we have been studying Paul's letter to the Colossians, and we have been learning about the fullness and, and richness of Christ and all we are in him. Our reading for today is Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Paul writes, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This morning, I want to focus on just these four verses. The Apostle Paul is a very dense writer. So let's try to unpack these verses one by one and see what they might be saying to us. Paul begins the first verse. Uh, Since then you have been raised with Christ. <clears throat> this marks the transition from the previous chapter. The main point in the preceding verses was that Christians should not follow false teachers. They should not abide by old laws from the old world. Why not? Because they have died with Christ. Colossians 2.20 says, Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as through you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Dying with Christ really challenges us to become free of our old lives. But what comes after dying with Christ? That brings us back to chapter 3, verse 1. We have been raised with Christ. Without dying, there is no rising. There is no shortcut. Dying must come first. We die with Christ. We put off our old ways. And then we are raised with Christ. Baptism is often interpreted as a metaphor for death and resurrection in Christ. Our immersion in water represents death. Rising out of the water represents new life in Christ. We come out of the water as a new creation. In fact, we find this very idea in Colossians 2. 12. It says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. We see how closely our dying and rising is linked to Christ's death and resurrection. So what do we do after putting off our old ways and being raised with Christ? Paul tells us in verse 1, set your hearts on things above where Christ is. And in verse 2, set your minds on things above. So, after we have died and been raised in Christ, we must set our hearts and our minds on things above. Living in the power of the resurrection opens up a whole new perspective. We direct our lives upward towards Christ. When Paul says, set your hearts and set your minds on things above, he's not just making recommendations. These are commands. We are to be dead to the old world because we have risen with Christ. There is much beauty in this. But, also, but it also brings a certain tension. We are dead to sin and we have been raised with Christ but yet we continue to struggle. We really struggle to set our minds on God. The struggles within ourselves and the struggles with each other in the church and in the world show that we are not quite dead to the world. Paul commanded the Christians in Colossae to set their hearts and minds on heavenly things because they were falling short. 
the Colossians have indeed, be, indeed been raised with Christ, but Paul still has to tell them to live that reality. Paul has to call on them to do better and examine themselves. Indeed, the whole book of Colossians speaks of a deep desire to grow in knowledge, in moral maturity and endurance, in spiritual wisdom and understanding. It wants us to work on ourselves. It is, this is not just an individual pursuit. When Paul says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things be above, you and yours refer not just to one individual. You is plural. Paul is writing to the whole church. There is a collective dimension. This means that community matters. We are accountable to one another. We are challenged as a church to grow and to follow Christ together. Now, I wonder whether you have ever seen these letters, BPP, G-I-N-F, W-M-Y. I only came across them recently when a friend told me about them. But what do these cryptic letters mean? Well, they mean, please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. In addition to making people curious, these strange letters also acknowledge that we need to work on ourselves. We are not perfect, but we must set our hearts and minds on things above where Christ is. So where indeed is Christ? The very end of Colossians 3 once tells us that Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. We have this expression, right hand ma man. We say that so and so is the boss's right hand man. A right hand man works closely with his boss and the boss can trust his right hand man completely. Colossians 3 1 is telling us that Christ is God's right hand man. The idea that Christ is sitting at the right hand of God also goes back to Psalm 110, verse 1. The psalmist says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This verse is quoted 23 times in the New Testament. That is more than any other verse from the Old Testament. Why is this verse so important? Well, it underlines the exalted position of Christ following on from the resurrection. Paul alludes to this verse in Colossians to explain Jesus' unique position and divine sovereignty over all things. Christ sitting at the right hand of God mean, means that all powers have been subjugated to him. Christ has defeated all enemies. I did not know what a footstool was until I visited the Egyptian Museum in Cairo many years ago. You can see, there you can see thrones that have small footstools in front of them. The Pharaoh of Egypt would sit on the throne and put his feet on the stool. As you can see in the picture, these footstools are decorated. They depict the Pharaoh's enemies. By putting his feet on his enemies, the Pharaoh symbolically crushes them and proclaims his victory over them. But with Christ, it is different. Christ did not win a military victory. There is a profound sense in which Christ is seated at the right hand of God because of the resurrection. So let's think about the resurrection. We are familiar with the Easter greeting, Christ is risen, and the response, he is risen indeed. This proclamation was central to the preaching and teaching of the early church. Christ surely defeated his enemies, enemies but it was not with, with the sword, it was with obedient and suffering love, love on the cross. And then comes the key point. God vindicated Christ by raising him from the dead. Through the resurrection, Christ became the Lord of the entire universe. 
God raised him up and put all things, all powers under his command. God highly exalted Christ, giving him the name above every name. It is interesting to see that Colossians 3.1 does not explicitly refer, uh, refer to the resurrection of Christ. It just assumes it. You have been raised with Christ presupposes that Christ has been raised. Everything Paul says in these verses is grounded in the resurrection and resurrection power. And that is why we can be a people of hope. That hope that is stored up for us in heaven. The hope that is grounded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ has triumphed. He has disarmed the powers and authority, authorities and set us free. In Colossians 3.2, Paul writes, set your, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Then in verses 3 and 4, Paul gives us the reason why we should focus on things above. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. The reason that we should set our minds on things above is because we have died to the old world and because our lives are now hidden in Christ. What does it mean to be hidden with Christ? Paul says back in Colossians 2, 3, that Christ is the mystery of God and that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And now in chapter 3, verse 3, we are told that your life is now hidden with Christ in God. This verse clearly speaks of a union with Christ that is hidden. This is a hidden union because it is heavenly. Nobody can see it or feel it. It means that we are deeply wrapped up with Christ. Sometimes parents wrap up their young children in a blanket and hold them tightly. The children often love it because it gives them security. We might think of our hiddenness in Christ to refer to our protection in him. To be hidden in Christ gives us security. In Christ we find rest and solace from life's stresses. Our hiddenness with Christ in God also echoes David in Psalm 27, 4 to 5. David says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. David desires to be in the house of the Lord, to look upon the beauty of the Lord. He is seeking his beauty because God has hidden him in his temple and because God has set him high, God has exalted him. But our hiddenness in Christ also looks to the future. Elsewhere in Colossians, the word hiddenness refers to something that is first concealed and then revealed. Colossians 1.26 says, The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. In the same way, our hiddenness with Christ in God will one day be revealed. For Paul says in Colossians 3.4, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When Christ appears in his glory, we also will appear with him. Without Christ, we are nothing. Without Christ, we have no future. We have no identity. But hidden in Christ, we will appear with him. Just as we have died with Christ and been raised with him, so also we have been concealed with him and we appear with him in his glory. This appearance with him in glory will be both spiritual and physical. We will become whole and our tired bodies and souls 
will find rest and peace. Paul knew the Colossians had not reached that day when they would appear with him with Christ in glory. They were nowhere close. Some of them were getting distracted with shadows and angels apart from Christ. They were getting wrapped up with things that led them away from Christ. So Paul had to tell them forthrightly to set their hearts and minds on things above, to keep working on themselves, to look up to Christ, victorious, seated on the right hand of God. We also have not reached that day of our appearing with Christ in his glory. We may not even feel close to it. We may not even feel worthy of such a glorious future. We may feel entirely broken and cast down. We may cry for mercy. P B P G A N I uh, G I N F W M Y. Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Yet, let us take comfort and security in the knowledge that we are hidden with Christ in God. We have a glorious future. We will appear with Christ in his glory. In the meantime, let us prepare ourselves for that day by listening and obeying Paul's command. Let us set our hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Amen. I invite you to stand up to pray the Lord's Prayer in community. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're just going to take a moment uh, now to, to just pause and reflect on, on what we've heard and uh, that prayer there as we call out to our Father. And it's right that we close our time together uh, and we're just going to praise that sufficiency of Christ as we sing that song in Christ alone.
till he returns or calls us home. Here in the power of Christ, we stand. Thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you'll join us again next Sunday when Michael Hall will be bringing closing part of our series in Colossians. But until we meet again, let not your love for one another be like the morning dew that early goes away. Let it be like a spring whose waters never fail, pouring forth from the fountain of God. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.